So when Christie's uh, first book became an award-winning book, we knew we, we had no choice except to present him here tonight. And if there was any question about that decision, I can just look around and see why that was a good decision. One of the things, maybe the only request Christy made was could you try to get Larry Herskovich? And um, about two years before I took over the reins from Christy, I think Eileen Miles might have been the featured voice. I'm not quite sure, but we ended up at Bravo Bravo and you were there and she had a big personality and you were just singing and I was so glad when Christy said maybe you could get her. <laughs> and then Lara said maybe I could be there. So she rearranged a couple schedules to be here with us tonight. Um, Lara has the honor of being the Connecticut State Troubadour. Also, I think one of the highest praises for her came from the Boston Globe, where she talks about, where they talk about the, the voice and the breadth and the heart of Lara who was trained in psychology and moved on to social work and um, then onwards to music. So bring it on, baby. We're so glad to have you here tonight. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Evening. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here and honored to be here alongside Albert and Christy. And uh, I'm going to start you off. With the title track from my most recent album, which I released in early April of 2020 because I am a terrible business person. <laughs> and so I figure it's new for five years. This song, I want to start here as well. Because it was inspired by four different poems. So it feels fitting to start here this evening. It was inspired originally by a poem in song, The Philosopher's Stone, by Van Morrison. It was inspired by part of a Rumi poem, um, something along the lines of out beyond, out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And two Robert Frost poems, The Road Not Taken and this one. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. We are highway philosophers, we can drive, Alongside all the toughest truckers, we ride gently through the night. We let our lives take by in lollipop signs, two tenths of a mile at a time. We flew in yesterday on dragonfly wings, came around. 
you're just in time to see this new day begin. One road not taken, then the next, then the next, then the next. Till we found ourselves standing right here in this gorgeous wilderness. stone questions and promises to keep and 100 200 3 4 500 highway miles to go before we sleep we swim in concrete rivers and dark corners of our minds any given moment, shine a light in there. You don't know what you'll find. So many theories piled high. While we watch the tire pressure getting closer to the true meaning of life. And somewhere in our container, there's a door to a field. Any time of day or night, just say the word, we'll get the landing gear. Try to make something clear, something clear. Maybe what we found, what we lost, all the blind spots or the cost of where we steer. We built our home in the philosopher's stone. on my skin when any fog rolls in I know precisely where to begin yeah, we built our home in the philosopher's stone promises and questions to keep and 100, 200, 3, 4, 500, I-95 piles. Yeah, we built our home in the philosopher's stone. Promises and questions to keep. And 500, 600, 7, 8, 900, highway miles to go.
I'm so happy to be back with you. I've been live streaming from my home. My commute was from the living room to the studio and back again, and this is so much better. Thank you for being here, Lisa. Thank you for taking the reins. Christy, Albert, thank you for creating the reins in the first place. Yeah. This has just always been one of my favorite gatherings and evenings because the best music, in my opinion, is lyric poetry. And we, musicians and poets, don't often come together like this. This is such a special, such a special thing that I'm honored to be part of the extended family. And, and tonight especially, congratulations on your brand new book. I can't wait to read it. questions. Can you imagine the visit to the hardware store? I don't need to actually paint. Maybe they can 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I don't know what you have been through. What a time. What a time. What a time we are living through. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know who you've lost. But I know it's a lot because it's a lot. And so I want to send this next song out really in memory of those hearts that aren't beating on this plane anymore. And also for these hearts that are carrying those memories and that legacy and those values forward. Some poems arrive. Don't touch me, I am here. It does not happen to me very often. This one is called From a Dream, and it was. into words how profoundly the arts in general, in all of its forms, helped me survive the last stretch. It's always been true, but wow, was it really true. And I just want to say thank you to all of my fellow gal, human art makers, creators. Believe that to be a happy, healthy human is to be creative, and so I hope that's everyone in here. And such deep gratitude and respect for Lisa, now your team of volunteers, and everyone who continues this tradition. So I started this song with one of my favorite pieces, uh, choral pieces, Dona Nobis Pachem, which means, of course, grant us peace. You all are language people. I don't need to tell you. from a dream into a dream. 
presence on a wooden bench in the fog. A little lonely, but everything, 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 everything would be all right. And the time, the time, the time, the time. While the child sat wondering, sometimes waiting, but not knowing what for. The mountain laurel bloomed, white and pink as the strawberry moon, shining light onto a path to tomorrow. A spider crawled up and onto the page as if to say, this dream, your dream, is here, right now, with me, with the child waiting in the fog, wondering, a little lonely, but everything, everything, everything would be all right. stood still and then went out into the day, into all that wilderness and all that wondering, all that wondering with the child in the fog, waking up from a dream into a dream. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and old anxiety for all anxiety, my dear. For all anxiety, we'll take a cup of kindness yet. For all anxiety, and there's a hand, my trusty. Give a hand of thine, we'll take the right good will draft for all thine. Tona, no holy spotcha. Tona, no We'll take a cup of kindness, yes. Yeah. I'm going to leave you with this one. This is one of those songs that took a, took a journey that was unexpected. The song is called Shine, Sister Shine. I wrote it from the perspective of the sun. There's a debate in literature about whether the sun is, what gender the sun is. And I identify as female and it's my song, so the sun is female. So if you want the sun to have a different or non-gender, you can write your own song. <laughs> creativity. I wrote the song on a day when I was in the middle of a very successful pity party. <laughs> it was a good one. It was a good one. And I was working, as I always do, to find my way back to gratitude. And so I started thinking about other professions that are more challenging than this. And eventually that line of thinking brought me to the sun. I thought the sun works harder than any of us. Never gets to take a break. <laughs> Just completely taken for granted. So you'll see what, yeah. And um, the pandemic grounded us, as you know. And so we were looking for new projects. There's only so much touring one wants to do from one's living room to one's studio and back again. And um, so I worked with an animator, a terrific animator in Michigan named Matt Rash. We've done a number of music videos together. They're all on my YouTube channel for free. Please enjoy them. Please subscribe. I'm very close to the baseline benchmark of 1,000 subscribers, and this room could probably get me over the <laughs> hurdle. Like really, it makes a difference. I promise you it makes a difference. Thank you. We made an animated music video, and then there was still all sorts of time. 
So we took the animated music video and transformed it with the help of amazing book designers in New Haven called Design Monsters and turned it into a full color hardcover illustrated book for children of all ages, which you can see over there at our joint table. You can also get Christie's book over at that table. On the back of the book, there is a very cute rooster and the rooster is staring at the reader, imploring the reader, myself included, to be who you are, do what you love and share your superpowers with this world that is asking us all to show up and help make this world healthier in any of the many ways this world is asking us to show up and shine. So thank you for all of the things that you do that help make this world healthier. Shine, sister. She said she used to love the way they all rely on her. But lately feels more obligation than she preferred. Round and round, round, same circle, First, 93 million miles each way. Someplace always needs her, so much at stake. Cause someone's gotta make sure all the roosters are away. <laughs> She's singing, I don't wanna work, but they need daytime. I have to shine, sister, shine, sister, shine. I know I don't wanna work, but they need daytime. So I shine, sister, shine, sister, shine. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Thought she'd start a new career, got some interviews. The clouds always covered for her, eclipses too. Five billion year background on her resume. She lives in the Milky Way, but is willing to relocate. Raise your hand if you agree. She's a star, travels at the speed of light. But the interviewer did not agree that she was qualified. Mm. She's singing now. This is an amazing turnout. And on behalf of the Arts Cafe Mystic and Christy Williams and Albert Kalush and Lara Herskovich, I thank you all so much for showing up tonight. It's a cold evening. I'm gonna pause for just a second so that after 
Christy's reading, I don't have to do a lot of announcements. What I want to do right now is once again thank you all for being here. Thank all of you who are donors to the Arts Cafe. We couldn't make it without you. My volunteers, Jim Marshall has never missed a show in 28 and a half years filming. Let's start with Jim. My board members, uh, Owen's here, uh, Charlie's here, Liz is here, John is here, Thea's here, Wendy would be here, she's done so much for us. Also, uh, Julia's right here up front, and the team of volunteers that they bring with them. Kate Moffat has been volunteering for 28 years, so we thank you for that. That can't be easy, in particular, when parking's a drag. Um, but all of you, you know who you are. In particular, it's hard for me to not look out in the crowd and not see a single person who hasn't been a donor to the Arts Cafe. So we thank you with everything that we've got for that. This is such a uh, fluky introduction. Christy William, Christy Max Williams is the champion of introductions. I was introduced by him four times, and four different times I didn't know who I was. He made me sound so grand. <laughs> Christy makes himself easy to be grand, and I'll get to that for in a second. But right now, I do want to honor three people, and that would be Christy Williams, Albert Couch, and Melanie Greenhouse for having the fortitude to start the Arts Cafe 28 years ago. For those of you who received the public relations stretches, you know that uh, Albert was a little bit of a beatnik running an uh, open mic at the Blue Jeans Cafe at the Eugene O'Neill Theater. Christy was transitioning from New York to Mystic Stonington to raise his two children. And he went to this one open mic and it sparked something for him. And um, so spoken word got itself a place. Um, when the two of them decided they wanted to start this vision called the Arts Cafe Mystic, they both knew maybe they weren't the one to be the administrator. <laughs> and that's when they approached Melanie Greenhouse. And um, as Christy let me know three weeks ago, you are accountable, Melanie, for putting the Arts Cafe Mystic on the map in terms of destinations. So with gratitude for, from both of the gentlemen and all of us to you for carrying, carrying a vision through 10 years. Um, when, we, when we reopen in March, we'll start with Youth Shall Be Served. That's a, that's a program that Melanie started 28 years ago. So um, with gratitude to all three of you for your vision, we're all so grateful to be here. So for those of you who are familiar with the Arts Cafe, maybe you've noticed that Christy and I have very different styles. Um, and perhaps we both have a lot to learn from each other, but I mostly have a lot to learn from Christy. As the director of the Arts Cafe who hired me three different times to come and read my poems, he never let on for a second that he was practicing his own craft himself. And it wasn't until I received his first manuscript and then a revised copy of the manuscript and the final one, which won a huge prize, as you all know. Um, 
One of Christie's very unique gifts as a poet is taking form and formality and making it feel so real and approachable that I wouldn't have noticed unless I learned from him that so many of the poems that he writes that seem to be in free verse are actually written in sonnets, in um, villanelles, in forms that if he decides to share these poems with you tonight, he might explain a little bit more of the form that he used. When I spoke to him a few weeks ago about his call to poetry, he did speak about um, meeting Albert, going to an open mic, and the fact that at that point in his life, he didn't have much use for contemporary American poetry. It mostly sounds like somebody like me talking. And if you've got a good voice, it sounds really good. Um, Albert gets credit for turning Christie on to contemporary American poetry. That is, that that breaks away from traditional form it would be hard to not um, finish this introduction without mentioning Marilyn Nelson, which was a formative, formative reading for Christie. He got introduced to the poetry locally, heard a reading by Marilyn Nelson, felt like, all right, maybe it's not all that bad, this free verse. And in fact, when they opened um, 28 years ago, Marilyn Nelson was their opening voice. Um, Christie's poetry will speak for itself. Most of you are here because you know him. His etiquette, his respect, his professionalism, these are all things I stand in awe of. I'm so grateful to introduce you, Christy. Welcome back to your own stage. <laughs> no warmth, no cheerfulness, no healthful ease, no comfortable feel in any member, no shade, no shine, no butterflies, no bees. No fruits, no flowers, no leaves, no birds. November. <clears throat> I wish I had written that poem. <laughs> I must say that it's a, that to be here, before you like this, was never something that I remotely imagined. And it is, it is an astonishment for me. Um, I'm going to do my best to make it an astonishment for you. <laughs> the first of my poems that I'd like to share with you was, is a sort of variation on theme. And, and it's a theme that, was, that, that I read in one of Pablo Neruda's 100 Sonnets of Love. If you've never encountered this book, it will change your life and, and uh, move you as it did me. Um, in this book of 100 sonnets, he, uh, all of which are addressed to his wife, Matilda, Imagine Pablo Neruda being married to somebody named Matilda. <laughs> Anyhow, he said about Matilda, naked, like a knight in Cuba. Isn't that a great line? This poem is called Naked. Naked, moonlike in the dusk, you rise above my frozen field, full and white. Your slow, insightful feet and flashing thighs, dancing, dancing their curved and urgent light. 
Naked you wait like a rock in rain, ecstatically enduring spring's rough measure. Each drop upon your skin, a shining stain of deep, impassioned pleasure. Naked you lie, speckled in the sun like a too ripe peach dropped from a high limb, split open, juices leaking, flesh undone, your fertile pit imagining its fragrant climb. Naked like smoke, you curl articulate above my smoldering fire, your ghostly voice intoning delicate demands into the darkened corners of desire. Naked your eyes of sea and sky, naked your open hand like a nest, a haven, naked your hair of wheat, naked your belly like a morning in July, the warmth before the heat, naked your heart, like a bird singing, like a warbler in the instant before springing into flight, naked. I have never read that poem in a public setting like this. <laughs> you can see why. <clears throat> You're going to hear uh, several poems that have never been written, read in a public place tonight. Um, uh, some of them are from my book, The Wages of Love, which I'm very proud won the William Meredith Prize, the great post-war poet William Meredith, to have my name associated with his is remarkable in itself. It's remarkable to stand at this, this very podium. Look at this, it's got this little cubby hole here. Um, the, the great poet and critic Sandy McClatchy stood at this podium and said, this is the smallest lectern I've ever stood at. <clears throat> but but uh, <laughs> but at this at this exact lectern, this very piece of furniture, if you will, have stood some of the great poets in America. Well, some of our greatest poets, Sharon Olds, right at this platform. Donald Hall, Philip Levine, Billy Collins, and so many, many, many others. It's swell to be here. <laughs> it's true, I do write um, some, some of my poems in traditional forms. Um, this is, let's see. Let's see, let's be sure what this is, yeah. See, the, the problem with this lectern is hard to get all this stuff on here. Okay, this poem, huh. as a young man, I had the great good fortune to live, oh, for almost a year in Paris, where I wrote the first of my three unpublished novels. <laughs> this poem is called French Kiss. It's written in that most French of forms, the villanelle. It's a love poem. When I burned bright, Paris alone was true and life was art. Or was it the other way around? Paris is where I am when I'm with you. Through endless cafe nights in drizzly Rue Saint-Jacques, my genius fevered to be found. When I burned pure, Paris was truly true. Bravely I stormed those barricaded blue, white, and red French hearts, 
Bohemian Unbound. Paris is where I nearly died of the flu. The boulevard perfume, the nightly coo of good cheap wine, the loneliness profound when I burned hot. Paris was coolly true because the women there speak French and do not kiss Americans, meaning to astound. Paris is where I first imagined you. We are old now, as Paris is forever new, as life is you now, as art may still confound. When we burn deep, every Paris is true. Paris is where I am when I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you. The temptation, I must tell you, is to read every poem I possibly can to you. <laughs> I don't think I'll do that, no, no. Um, here, is, here is a different sort of poem. This, this poem recounts a, an episode from my childhood. I grew up in Southern California, as uh, some of you know. Um, do you remember? Do you remember being a childhood, and and having one of those realizations, something that just astounds you? Um, this poem recounts such a, a realization. It's called First Blood. Then I heard it, the long, slow screech of skidding tires on pavement. In church, a small, strange boy in thrall to finger fidgets, I raised my head and listened to the prolonged road shriek, listened as it ceased with a concussive crash of steel and glass, then sudden stillness. Was it sound or silence that reverberated in my restless mind? And why had no one else looked up? Had they heard it? Had I? After prayers, after what seemed distant sirens, after punch and cookies on the sunny patio among the grown-ups, with their cigarettes and coffee. I asked my folks if I might walk the few streets home from church. Then, unobserved, I headed to my secret path, the beaten track of dirt between the forest of oleanders by the road, where I was certain no one else would be. The skinny trail was baked and hard, the canopy of oleanders shifted with the breeze. And then, as always on that path, I felt that something was about to happen. And suddenly, there was a shiny shard of steel, which wasn't there a week ago. Curved, fist-sized, a hole at one end. I held and fingered it until, just ahead, a glint of glass distracted me, smaller than a marble, a jagged nugget tinged a pale, clear aquamarine. And kneeling to it, holding it, I peered through a gash in the oleanders to the road, where on the pavement a splash of glassy nuggets glistened in the sun. Then I was stopped stopped where I almost stepped, the tips of Sunday shoes a step from it, a shining puddle in the path, a puddle brilliant red, a redness new to me. The world was still as squatting on my haunches I considered it, reached 
and touched a finger to the puddle's surface, drew the finger up, thought to taste it, realized it must be blood. I wondered if it could be God, I felt, but decided it was not. And yet, what was that light? What was that sound, that smell, that taste? What else but death's pure aura? In that bright stillness, a shudder worked my spine. Then I myself grew still and understood. I, too, would someday die. The day was bright and warm. Life was deeply strange and new. But I was not afraid. I did not understand to be afraid. First blood. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, I went to school in California. Um, this poem um, took place at the University of California at Berkeley, where I oh, was educated. It's called Goethe in California. You all know the great German poet, um, novelist, critic, um, Goethe. It's important you know that for this poem to work. Goethe in California. Oh, to be young in California, to be blessed and cursed with a mind on fire. There we gathered, the hopeful best and brightest of our generation, gathered outside that hallowed hall of learning in the midday sunshine of a swelling spring, circled on the new mowed lawn beneath that blooming cherry tree. She too arrived, aglow, amazed all too apparently by life, though smiling shyly, if slyly, at me. For lately I had taught her how to kiss. A willing pupil, though apt to let her teeth click eagerly on mine. I'm reading something so far out, she said. It's called The Stranger by a French guy, Albert Camus. <laughs> Albert Camus, I interrupted in my freshly honed, though fledgling, French. And it's l'étranger, I finished with a flourish, scarcely noticing her flashing eyes, her flushed cheeks, her mute humiliation, as I proceeded to hold forth on Camus' Sisyphus, on human toil and suffering in a godless world on man's responsibility to make a meaning of compassion. But the book I was combustible about was Gethy's Sorrows of Young Werther. <laughs> its sturm and drang, its tragic beauty of an unrequited love, and oh, how I soared like a German eagle in my wild flight. Until another of our gathering, a friend, spoke up to say, I think you may mean Goethe. <laughs> the world stopped. <laughs> what? I said. I felt all eyes fixed on my face. The air was still. The sun was in my eyes. I could not breathe. And it's Werther. Not Werther, he added with a helpful smile. <laughs> Goethe, Goethe, Goethe. What sinister and senseless sort of world would say or spell a great man's name that way? I may have nodded in reply, 
but surely didn't speak. In my humiliation, utterly unutterable, I looked to her, and meeting with her eyes, I was amazed to see in them the very color of compassion. <laughs> uh, is, is there anything more ridiculous than a young man? <laughs> All right. Now for something entirely different. This poem, too, I have never read in a public setting. Um, are you fascinated as I am by coincidence? Nod your head, yes. It'll help, it'll help. Um, this poem has an epigraph uh, from Albert Einstein, which reads, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Um, uh, this poem is titled uh, Coincidence on 27, and it refers to Route 27 here in Mystic. This, this, uh, this poem is about an actual event that I'll wager you read about in the newspaper. It's in three parts. Coincidence on 27, part one. Oh, I should also mention that there, it's interspersed with rhyming couplets here and there. Part one, coincidence on 27. Route 27 is the real way to mystic. The mystical way, you might say. They were old and in love, Joanna and her Seth. Joey, he called her, their private shibboleth for the cheerful pal she was to him. With younger friends, they'd just done dinner in a mystic joint on 27, where they were known and fussed about like family just arrived for holidays. By all accounts, the group had been convivial. Good food, the wine abundant. It had been a night well lived. The world, too, was old that night. Thirteen billion years of brooding hindsight. Gaily they departed, Seth and Joey, shuffling steps behind their friends, walking out into the wintry night. It was early yet, cold and clear, the crescent moon still rising past the stars, the tidal river's scent still sharp and briny. The night was fine, although the light was red. Warmly wrapped in coats and scarves, they started across the road, hand in hand beyond the painted crosswalks, following their friends against the light. Perhaps they didn't see the car. Perhaps they heard it first, looked up, glimpsing headlights, tires skidding, shrieking, just before it pounded them upon the pavement. The earth, too, was no longer new, Four billion years and more of hitherto. Together in the, the instant on the naked road, Seth reached for her, softly spoke her name twice, then forever joined her, dead. Everybody said that they would always be together. Part two. A mere but fraught 200,000 years, mankind has walked the earth with hopes and fears. Carol Belly was alone and old, a modern mother divorcee contentedly retired from teaching school. Like death and taxes, this much was certain. 
That fateful evening, she had met a friend in a familiar cozy bar, that part of mystic shunned by tourists, where they had split small bites, flatbreads, fish tacos, while Carol had a vodka gimlet, bone cold and limey sharp the way she liked them. They talked, as women do, smart and funny, a mutuality of unassertive warmth, talked of family, of politics. Carol had another. She had done her medication, felt herself the one she liked to be. When they left, the night was deep and cold, the moon a white and quiet crescent. But she was hungry still, and knew McDonald's would be open at the other end of 27. In a world both sacred and profane, fate is sometimes this mundane. The cops efficiently presumed her drunk, although the test said not. But through her curbside tears, she allowed as how she wasn't sober sober. In any case, she hadn't nodded off behind the wheel. In any case, until too late, she hadn't seen them. In any case, they were dead. And where had God been all this time? What was he doing? This cannot be one more mere rhyme. Then, of course, part three. Then, of course, the law, the lawyers, then the bargained plea to spare an old and ruined woman from the slammer. Then the civil suit and settlement one and a quarter mil the price of loss for Seth and Joey's grieving people. The most their lawyers said that shame and policy could pry from the insurance companies. Still, Seth and Joey went at once, together, to their faded but, in their faded but persistent bloom of health, happy and old aged, Loved and loving. Really, what better way to go? Except that Carol Belly's life of ordinary hopes and happiness was and was not done with. Well then, can it be both curse and praise to say God works in mysterious ways? Thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, some of you know that I'm an actor as well as a poet, and where we live, um, we, there are lots of small streets, and I walk these small streets with a script in hand, or sometimes a book of poems, and I declaim. <laughs> it's the only way that I know how to really learn lines. And, and as you might imagine, um, in our neighborhood, I have a reputation. <laughs> um, uh, this book is, uh, this poem is called Blue Heart. Um, a couple of notes you'll, you, you might benefit from. There are uh, references to uh, great poets' lines. Uh, one of Emily Dickinson's, one of uh, Walt Whitman's, uh, and a note from Robert Frost as well. Blue Heart. Hailed by name as I walked up the narrow road that passed his place, as I looked up from the open book I had in hand, core struck, heart on edge, though not quite zero at the bone, as he, with a salesman's smile, said to me, you're into poetry, right? Were they fighting words, I wondered? Was flight an option? Or did I have the right to find my notoriety amusing? 
And really, what the hell could he be smiling at? Why do you ask? I might have parried. What do you mean, I thought to answer? Well, yes, is what I said. A quarter century we had been first name acquainted, though I didn't think I liked the guy. Too glib, too friendly, too damned pleased with life. Come here, he beckoned me onto his patch of lawn. His dooryard, Whitman would have termed it. And so help me, there were lilacs blooming. So I joined him on the grass by a massive boulder there, eight feet across and high. A remnant of the ice age, he was saying. Boulder, ice age, glacier in retreat. To all of it, I nodded my encouragement as he invited me to circumnavigate the rock, as he explained how he had just cleared it of a generation's brush and vines. And he went on, describing how he'd taught his kids to climb the rock, showing me the hand and footholds, to which I smiled with something like goodwill. But look at this! He stopped us in our glacial tour, pointing to an indentation in the rock where long ago a child's hand had painted a blue heart the height and size of a childish head. I cried when I discovered it, he said. His voice was open, touchingly sincere. And then he said, well, you could write a poem about it. <laughs> I might have laughed out loud, might have shaken my head in proud refusal, but only a heart of stone could be unmoved by his request. Though in my silent pride, I scoffed at how he thought that poems happen. Robert Frost called poetry, play for mortal stakes. I doubt the stakes Frost had in mind include blue hearts. And yet, something was happening by that rock something I did not understand, but somehow felt. He was a man who'd spoken tender thoughts to me, and I'd been humbled as I heard them. We'll see, I said, and shrugged the way men do. If not a promise, it was something like consent. But in the weeks to come, I could not do it could not make a poem of that damned blue heart. Though my walk still take me by that rock, I cannot find a poem there. Perhaps it's his to write. Blue heart. As, as the great poet Margaret Gibson said to me after reading this poem, she said, but you did write the poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, this book of poems is divided into three parts. The first part is, is called The Wages of Love. The title poem of the book is among those. The second part is uh, titled Family Matters. And they're all poems about family. Um, Usually when I do readings from this book, I read poems about my parents. But you know, they're dead. And, and they, can't, they can't say anything about my poems anymore. Um, but on September 30, I became a grandfather. It's true. I, I had very little to do with it, actually. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but I became grandfather to a granddaughter, and, uh, and Nora Adele is her name. A nice name, Nora Adele. Her mother is here tonight. 
And I thought I'd read a few poems that reach back to, uh, to when I was a young father. Um, the, the first of them uh, is, is sort of a, a dialogue with the uh, Christian nativity story, um, as you'll hear. Um, but uh, the sort of subtext to it is all about being modern parents. It's called Bethlehem Again. It's after all about a family, about one fiercely ordinary man and his serenely mighty woman, for she within her bears the unthought perfect plan. Together, they are traveling the great and all too common journey home. Even as the world's woes await the bravely destined child to come, the dark old story tells itself again of prophecies perplexing simple hearts, of angels terrifying decent men, and of the parents playing their bit parts. Yet after all ends badly, they shall, we shall die. But listen, can you hear the newborn's urgent cry? Bethlehem again. This next poem, huh, I've never read. Uh, let's see how it goes. It's called, it's called Hard Night. It was a hard night, the hardest of nights as through the long dark hours you worked at birth. Hard the work, hard the pain upon your rights of first maternity, hard the winter earth, and bitter, bitter hard the smell of blood, and so much blood so red upon the sheets. Like echoes from the hot primeval mud, your groans and growls divulged where life secretes its bestial mystery. It shone there in the fierce light of your eyes. It boiled in your tears. And when the night was done, it sang out from the child just uncoiled. Then dawn spread healing on the night's fresh wound, revealing how a little life may still astound. Hard night. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, yes, I think I will read this. This is a debut for this poem as well. Um, this is called New World. I don't think it needs explanation. All of these poems I've, I've, I've in this section thus far have been sonnets. I don't know whether you could tell, but it's New World. What a world lies squirming in my arms, smelling of humanity, shaped just humanly. This worldly new she swarms with futures fresh escaped. So this is innocence. This little hand clutched on my finger with neither good nor common sense compels an ancient trust. Oh, let it linger. Yes, and to protect the gentle light in these undoubting new blueberry eyes, I would believe in God, save money, fight wars, get a job, anything but cause my own demise. For having fathered this new world, I can see myself become the better man I mean to be. Uh, all righty. This 
This poem is called Tess Begins. In the strange dark hour of that not yet morning, after so hard and much a night, after your head tops teasing dalliance at the world's threshold, you finally slid forth in a fell rush of blood and slime into my waiting hands. Your head shaped like a thick banana. Your little legs and arms enfolded tightly like a chicken trussed and ready for the oven. Though new to birth's immense domain, though looked at to pronounce your gender, Alas, I saw that you were dead. In my dismay was dumb to say so. In any case, I'd never seen such pink and tender beauty as between your legs. Then suddenly your eyes popped open with a blue and searching light, even as your pucker, puckered mouth performed a perfect O of pure astonished wonder. Tess is the sound the earth makes when in February it dreams of spring. Thank you. Okay. I promised you something entirely new. These last two poems are they. This is a hard poem. Um, uh, if you feel it's upsetting, it's meant to be. It was upsetting to write. Um, throughout the poem, there are interspersed uh, lines that form the Lord's Prayer. This is called, And Then It Was Quiet in Uvalde. Our Father, who art in heaven, is your soul immortal? Then so is mine. The fire in me burns just as bright as yours. Like you, I'm someone's child. <clears throat> My mother suckled me, and at her feet I played for her. Like you, I wanted to be loved. Can you see then what it means? This feeling strange, this being strange? Hallowed be thy name. Like you, I went to school. Like you, I learned about the world. Did you know the world too is strange? Did you know the world is cruel? Thy kingdom come. Fourth grade was the worst. They laughed at me and said I wore the same clothes every day, the same black jeans and tee. I told my ma, who said, shut up. There was no money for new clothes. They tied the laces of my sneaks together. I didn't see, didn't know. When I fell down, they cackled at my tears. Do you see now? Do you see? Thy will be done. In fourth grade, they said I talked ridiculous. The lisp, the stutter. I couldn't help it. I cried to Ma, who said she had no time. They knew that she did drugs. Everybody knew. And everybody had no time. Her boyfriend hit me hard then said, shut up to Ma. I wonder, did you ever know my pappy on earth? When COVID came, there was no school, and it was cool. The teachers Zoomed my cell. Ma was never there, and they weren't there. No one was there. COVID was really sick, as it is in heaven. At Yubo, my new friends believed me when I said I wasn't human. Cool, they said. I told them I was planning something big, something that would make me famous. 
everybody wanted to be famous. And when I sent them gore porn, they started calling me school shooter. School shooter, school shooter. It was so cool that it was sick. Give us this day our daily bread. The day Ma kicked me out, I went to live with my abuela. Abuela, she was smart and took no shit. But in her place, I had a room all to my own. And in two months, I'd turn 18. And then I would be famous. And forgive us our trespasses. Have you held a gun? Have you felt it? How balanced its heft, how cold and hard its muzzle, how light the action of its trigger, how satisfying when the cartridge clicks in place. Have you fired a gun? There is nothing like it in the world. A gun can be your friend. If something great is to be done, it needs a gun. As we forgive those for my 18th birthday, I bought a real gun, a Daniel Defense DDM-4. It was my birthday wish, a cool AR-15, America's rifle, it said online, with holographic sight and several hundred rounds of ammo, 5.56 boat tow, hollow points with fighting grade ballistics three times the speed of sound. You see, I was legal then. The guy, the gun guy asked me how I got the money. I saved, I said, flipping burgers in America. And when I showed the photos of my guns on Yubo, my friend said, cool. That trespass against us as I walked through the house to leave, the drumbeat of my plan was rocking in my head. Abuela was astonished. My new black swag, the guns, the magazine vest. I must have looked just like a nightmare superhero or like the SWAT cops. Furious but scared, she shouted, she shouted, said I could not leave, came at me. So I shot her in the face. The hole the bullet made was huge, bigger than a golf ball. Abuela, she went down like she'd been cold cocked. You should have seen the blood. It was amazing, but I didn't care. It didn't matter. It wasn't in my plan. But deliver us from evil. It was so easy at the school and so familiar. Nothing had changed. The door swung open easily. It wasn't locked. Everything inside was clean, so clean and bright. I felt at home. For thine, I fired in the hallway to scare the cops. Where were the cops? Even the door to room 112, my fourth grade classroom, opened easily, like in the day when I'd come back from pee break. Is the kingdom? The lady teachers looked at me, just stood and looked. They didn't know me in my black, my mask, my hoodie. I saw their fear but didn't care. It didn't matter. I shot them, a lot and fast. The bullets made them spaz and spin, like piñatas lurching to the stick, their bodies riddling with big red holes. The kids sat watching at their tables. Some began to whimper, some to cry slow tears, but it didn't matter. I shot them each. I shot them all. One kid's arm flew from his body. One kid's head fell off. It was amazing. You should have seen. And the power, the gun was beautiful, so firm and light to hold, such balance, so accurate, I couldn't miss. 
It was just like in the movies, the low thud sound of each round fired, the orange flame jetting from the muzzle, and the glory. Then I passed on through the door to 111. The kids were lying on the floor as though asleep. Before the teacher dude could speak, I shot him twice and watched as he went down. Then where they lay, I shot the kids. The floor was red and shiny slick with blood. I smeared some on the teacher's face. Then I dripped some water from a cup on him to see if he would move, to see if he was dead. I wasn't sure, so I shot him once more where he lay. Then to be sure, I shot the kids again, and then it was quiet. Everyone was dead forever and ever. The 111 teacher is an old white man. Looking down at him, I feel nothing. It seems so strange. His desk is clean and neat, the whiteboard clean and blank. And I do not hate the teacher, do not hate the room. So strange. The kids lie still. They look peaceful. I can remember being a kid. Sometimes back then, I liked it, liked my life. I do not hate the kids, and I'm not sorry to have killed them. Do you see? It was the only way. The clock ticks on the wall. The room is quiet, so quiet. Room 111, it was never quiet in fourth grade. Outside, a bird is chirping. The cops will come and kill me. I can hear them down the hall. What's taking them so long? I click a fresh full magazine in place. When the door cracks open, I'll be ready. I am not afraid. My name is Salvador Ramos, and I am famous. Um, I'd like to thank Lisa Starr and the Arts Cafe for inviting me here tonight. I'm deeply grateful to you for attending this evening. I love being on the same stage with Albert Kausch just moments after he's read. I love sharing the stage that Lara Herskovich, the wonderful Lara Herskovich, performed on. I'd like to leave you with a lighter poem. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bearing with that. This is called the... Uh, <laughs> I'd like to be able to state something uh, concerning that last reading. I know you, you've heard your poems, your sonnets. You were a very sensitive, loving family, cultural concern about making the world better. In that reading, it is so, so difficult to understand the effort that you have put into spelling that out. And I say to myself, why? Why do I have to know those details? Why do I have to know who these copycats are who go out and kill children. Where do they get the thought that they can be famous and their name 
things can be spread over the news media. So I'm saying to you, help me understand. Expression, interpretation, freedom, and the right to say what you want. But but you've been blessed with the ability to change people's lives and to impress upon them uh, the importance of what you see. So help. It seems to me the job of poets and poetry to delve into minds that can do such things, to to lay bare the soul of a person who is afflicted in that way. I, it is a, an honorable tradition of poets to do. Um, I have heard many great poets talk about such issues. Um, so I make no apologies, and would prefer if the poem stands on its own and explains itself. I know that's not a satisfactory explanation, but I didn't arrive here ready to explain my poems. This poem is called, The Speed of Light. From across the hurried room in a lover's blooming fury, she flashes her fiery eyes at you. And in the instant, you intuit that this bright, soul-searing burst from deep within her eyes is moving at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second the same speed at which starlight travels. And you recall that light from distant stars departed long ago, years and years ago, traveling near six trillion miles each year, and having journeyed over light years, has just arrived to Earth for you to see, through which you peer into the starry past. And in this moment's musing, you see the flashing from her eyes must have left a brief but measurable time ago. Time past, your past, a loutish past, albeit, and yet your eyes and brain synapses are also working at the speed of light, are in that instant's passing time, delaying further nonetheless your comprehension of the ire her eyes are firing to convey, or have conveyed, in fact, are pushing further in the past the whole damn flashing moment. Which begs the cosmic question whether you should even bother with responding to what even now is rapidly receding in the past. Your past, her past, every past, but increasingly the distant past. And after all, what does it mean to live within the moment? Which moment? And even though all this is happening at the speed of light, you have time to note that the delay in your response to the not quite yet forgotten flashing of her eyes is registering on her lovely face as smoldering exasperation. And yet, because you newly comprehend that time may not exist outside the mind, though in the mind is all too surely passing, and because you grasp that everything, but most especially she, is made of star stuff, you feel yourself 
falling like a comet, madly, brilliantly in love with her again, wanting her forever at the speed of light. Thank you. Everybody, each and all of you, for making it here tonight. It's a cold night. Parking's a little better because it is so cold. Now, we do appreciate your question. Um, Christy, I really appreciate your answer to that question. Uh, somebody once asked Joy Harjo, how do, we, how do we say it so that we don't forget? And Joy Harjo replied, ask the poets. So I want to applaud once again, Christy Williams for his amazing reading. <laughs> Albert Kausch for his amazing warm up and his fire that started the Arts Cafe 28 years ago. Lara Herskovich, they're all hiding over there. Lara. And Melanie Greenhouse, where are you, Melanie? Thank you all for being here with us tonight. If you have any questions at all about your parking vouchers, there should be somebody at the front desk to help you with that part of the process. Thank you again for your support. <laughs>